Good evening. I am the Maven of the Eventide and welcome to Vampire Reviews. Pop quiz time. What is the only thing better than a vampire? No, besides two vampires. No, besides three vampires. No, besides all the vampires. Come on, haven't you been my children of the night long enough to know the answer to this? I've only been talking to you people about vampires for 10 years now. Oh my god, 10 years? What is the only thing I love better than a vampire? A monster mash! Let's talk about Hemlock Grove. Must we? <sighs> Hemlock Grove was a Netflix original series. In fact, it was one of their very first solo original series, coming out only second after House of Cards premiered two months earlier. So it was being made at the same time. Might as well have been their first. I say this to point out that there may have been a bit of a learning curve involved in the beginning of Netflix's foray into producing series. Is that being generous of me? <sighs> Hemlock Grove ran for three seasons, 33 episodes, until its finale in 2015. And tonight, we are going to talk about season one, because that's all I can handle. Have mercy on me. Season one is based on the novel Hemlock Grove by Brian McGreevy. It was his debut novel, but he was no new writer, having made a career in screenplays beforehand. The novel came out in 2012, but even before it was released, he'd made a deal in 2011 to turn it into a TV series with himself as executive producer. As a writer, he says he sees screenwriting as the best iteration of dramatic writing. Even though he kept the TV series up for three seasons, there's only one book. McGreevy originally said he was working on sequel novels, but they never came to pass. Instead, it seems like he just used all his ideas for the two more seasons of the TV show we got. But season one tells the full story of the only novel. And that story is, well, yes, a monster mash, but also a serial killer murder mystery starring teenage vampires and werewolves in high school. The Twilight comparisons were inevitable, but McGreevy says it's purely coincidence that his high school monsters came out during the height of the Twilight craze, as he started work on the novel in 2006. He says, I learned about Twilight over the course of writing this book. I saw the parallels and was thinking, oh, that's interesting. I guess I'm more interested in watching teenagers actually have sex than Stephanie Meyer. And there is a lot of sex and gore and horror. The tone of Hemlock Grove is nowhere near Twilight's broody, soft romanticism. Hemlock Grove is gritty and dirty and ultra-violent. And McGreevy held a non-negotiable condition when he was working out the TV deal in 2011. This is not just an R. This is a hard R. Don't try to make this PG-13 to make it remotely marketable to what you're going to perceive as its target demographic. Teenagers? That's not going to happen. You can pry my rape scene from my cold, dead hands. I have no interest in seeing it neutered. So yes, this is the mind behind Hemlock Grove. You ready? With its dirty, small town over sexed and gory vampires and werewolves, we can surmise Netflix probably had high hopes of capturing HBO's True Blood audience when the show premiered the year before True Blood ended. And if you think I'm generalizing, may I add that the main vampire is played by a Skarsgård, and they hired True Blood's composer Nathan Barr to compose Hemlock Grove's music as well. The showrunners also copped to wanting to capture fans of the Walking Dead, an American horror story, eager to do some seriously NC-17 horror cinema on a platform where they would not be restricted by network TV's usual censorship. At the show's helm was Eli Roth, who you would know as the director of such films as Cabin Fever and Hostel, and he just fell in love with McGreevy's book. 
uh, his review of the book even appears on its cover. Uh, yep, right there. Or as the full version says... A wonderfully creative and twisted reinvention of classic monster archetypes, wrapped up in a mysterious thriller. I loved it! Brian McGreevy is a welcome new voice in horror literature. But be warned, it's not for the faint of heart or stomach. You see, Eli Roth was a huge David Lynch fan, and he had been eager for a while to find a property that he could make into his Twin Peaks. And Hemlock Grove just immediately spoke to him. McGreevy says that they instantly hit it off, and he felt that they were like kindred spirits in what they wanted out of a vampire show. At a panel at New York's 92Y Tribeca in 2012, Roth said, We wanted to do a show that asks, what if you really had these powers, but were in high school? Like, what would you do? <laughs> Not have sex? So I said, I want to see the show where a vampiric character hypnotizes girls. The cheerleader in class gets a period, and he follows her into the bathroom, and he goes down on her. You can't do that on TV. But you can on Netflix. That's what I liked about it that we could do something that was adult subject matter, and if we want to go dark and violent, we can. If we want to have the language, we can. We have the freedom to do something like it's on cable, to go as R-rated or as NC-17 as we want, where the teenagers could really behave like modern adolescents. This prompted McGreevy to ask the audience. We all actually want to see teenagers having sex, am I right? I believe that I am. I'm banking on it. <laughs> he doesn't mean in real life. He means when you watch a movie. The point is, let's not be afraid to go dark. So dark they went. And as I've said, it's not just a vampire show. It's a full-on monster mash. McGreevy took all his favorite gothic horror tropes, inspired by classic monster movies, uh, he admits that he never had time to read the books that the movies are based on, and put them all into the Pennsylvania Gothic setting of his own childhood. The main vampire character is Roman Godfrey, played by Bill Skarsgård in his first American role, trying so very hard to mask his Swedish accent. Roman is a 17-year-old high school student, and he doesn't know he's a vampire yet, though he's been one since birth, but he does know he has a sexual fetish for drinking human blood, hypnotic powers to make people do what he wants, and a snobby, too-cool-for-school, loner, rich boy attitude. He's not the most popular boy in school, but because he's tall and handsome and scars guardy, and the heir to the wealthiest family who runs this town, basically small-town American aristocracy, all the girls want him. Then there's his mother, Olivia Godfrey, a mysterious woman who only wears white because she's oh so ironic. Played by Famke Jensen, she controls her vampire urges by getting high off eye drop drugs. Until she doesn't, then she straight up eats people. She's the richest, classiest, snobbiest, most beautiful, most powerful lady in town, widow to the man who owned the steel mill that supported the entire town until he closed it and opened a nefarious biomedical laboratory instead. An extremely phallic nefarious biomedical laboratory called the White Tower, or the Godfrey Institute. Oh, we'll talk more about the vampires in a minute. Promise. Next, we have the werewolf. Peter Romancic is a half-Romani 17-year-old high school student. He was born a werewolf. He inherited his powers from his Romani side and has lived a nomadic life, only settling down in Hemlock Grove a couple months before the story starts, when he and his mother inherit a trailer. He presents the opposite side of the great class divide in this type of decaying steel industry Pittsburgh-like town. The extreme poor trailer trash down by the river contrasted with the wealthy elite on the hilltop. Classic snobs versus slobs, vampire werewolf rivalry. Oh, I should warn you that this show uses the G word a lot for Peter and his family. They use it for themselves, but it's also used as an insult by the racist high school kids and other people who hate Peter for his origins. Because we have no censorship on Netflix, so besides sex and gore, let's show tons of racism, homophobia, and misogyny as well. It's art. What? Is it too real for you to handle? Aren't we having fun? 
There are a couple other werewolves as well in the show, Peter's ancestors, and the werewolf behind the serial killer attacks whose unknown identity provides the mystery of the season's story arc. Or rather, because it's an insane werewolf that can shift at any time, not just at the full moon, it's called a varwolf. Because it quickly becomes obvious that a werewolf is behind the deaths, and some bitch at school has told everyone Peter's a werewolf, he spends the season working to prove he is not the werewolf in question to clear himself of being the prime suspect. But enough about werewolves. What other monsters do we get in our mash? Frankensteins? We got Frankensteins! This is Roman's sister and Olivia's other child, Shelley Godfrey. Named after Mary Shelley, of course, her far body shots are played by Amazon Eve, and her face and voice and dream self are played by Nicole Boyvin. Shelley is what happened when Olivia Godfrey murdered her baby because it wasn't born a vampire. Not the first non-vampire baby Olivia kills. Roman has been her only successful vampire baby so far. But Shelley's dad had her brought back to life at his nefarious biomedical laboratory. And it worked! But she came back monstrous. She can't talk, so can only communicate through email and text-to-speech. But much like the original Frankenstein creation, she is highly intelligent and rather pretentious in her use of language. Christina was absent from school yesterday. Poor innocent. I cannot imagine what toll the demon dog's handiwork must have taken on her. She also just wants to be a girl and have fun and make friends, but her controlling vampire mother makes it impossible. One of her brother Roman's initial only redeeming character traits is how much he loves and takes care of Shelley, protecting her from bullies at school and their own mother. In classic horror style, Shelley is of course suspected as being the one behind the murders, but really she's just a misunderstood sweetheart and super genius trapped in a monstrous form. See, see, she, she glows. That, that means she has inner beauty, because glowing is beautiful inside. I believe your niece earned some small measure of, dare she say it, respect. Speaking of monsters, we also have a witch, a slutty witch. This is Peter's cousin, Destiny Romantic, played by Kenny Tio Horn also a Romani person who makes her living reading fortunes and providing sexual healing rituals to the townsfolk. But she can do a lot more than that. As a spirit medium, we get to watch her perform an excruciatingly disgusting ritual where she eats a grave worm which fed on the juices of a decaying corpse to channel the spirit of the dead person so that Peter can ask it questions about how it died. So I guess in this sense, we get a ghost too. Check that one off the list. Ghosts, great. What else? What other monsters in our mash? Um, mummies? No, no mummies. N no zombies? Well, well, on to the fully non-magical human portion of the monster cabal. The mad scientist. This is Dr. Johann Price, named after Vincent Price, because why not? Played by Joel de la Fuente, he is the unethical genius behind all the nefarious biomedical experiments going on at the White Tower, the Godfrey Institute Laboratories. He's the one who brought Shelley back from the dead, and he's got a new sinister project in the works called Ouroboros, which is, well... We never find out in season one, but you can bet it's sinister. The sedation of the boy was unfortunate, comma, but in his condition, as necessary as his witness to the work, full stop. Should he wake, a report of Ouroboros will never be believed, semicolon. And knowing the truth, he is invalidated, full stop. He also, for some reason, has super strength. For a while, the police suspect the beast that's killing girls in town is some creature that escaped from Dr. Price's laboratories. But though he's not connected to the murders, we do find out that he's cleaned up bodies for Olivia Godfrey's shenanigans in the past. But although no animals have escaped from his evil mad science, an insane human test subject has, giving us a Renfield character. This is Francis Pullman, played by Ted Dixtra, and he doesn't do much in the show, beyond provide creepy cryptic mutterings and ominous hints about what nefarious science is going on at the Godfrey Institute. 
playing up all the escaped madman on the loose cliches until his own mysterious demise. Your wings are wet. Excuse me? And of course, where we have monsters, there must also be the monster hunter, the Van Helsing character, the vampire slayer, the werewolf tracker. This is Dr. Chisur, which is the French word for hunter, who, so deep, played by Candace McClure. She presents herself as an agent of Fish and Wildlife Services come to town to help the police hunt the rogue murderous animal. But really, she's a member of a clandestine Catholic organization of monster hunters called the Order of the Dragon. And she's on a mission from God to rid the world of werewolves and other creatures who go bump in the night. Conveniently, she's also having an alcoholic crisis of faith that makes her hold back from immediately destroying Peter, who she pegs for a werewolf the second she sees him, drawing out this nonsense for a full 13 episodes so that Peter can track down the true killer himself. Which he does! He, he does! Yeah, he, he gets it. The story begins with a high school girl getting brutally murdered by some wild animal eating her crotch. Some people accuse Peter because he's a no-good filthy G-word who rumor says is a werewolf, and some people accuse Roman because he's the freaky rich kid who has a history with every girl in town. Even this one, apparently, even though the first thing we're shown about her is that she's kind of gay and has a crush on her teacher. So the two boys end up teaming up to try to solve the mystery themselves, to clear their names, because they're the only ones who know a werewolf is behind it. While the cops search dead ends, they try to figure out who in town could be the other secret werewolf, or Vargolf, and spend months getting absolutely nowhere, while every full moon another teenage girl or two gets brutally slaughtered. Meanwhile, they encounter lots of symbolism that doesn't really go anywhere. Like, the Ouroboros is hammered in for us, but what does it mean? That life is cyclical? Yeah. Uh, we know that. Is, the, is there a point? The most compelling part of the whole story, to me, honestly, was the blossoming romance between these two boys. And it really is a romance. Hate at first sight, hits all the tropes, a mid-season breakup where everything seems lost and they get back together, framed entirely that way. And even though they never pass the beginning stages or admit it to themselves. We have the same dreams. Why are you here? You know, yeah, I thought I did for a while. I suppose you might call it queer baiting, but really it just felt to me like the start of their romance with promise that they'd get further with it in the next season. A and they do, right? Drama ensues when a girl comes between them, the hussy. Roman is clearly much more into Peter than Peter is into him, and when Peter falls for the token sweet innocent blonde virginal character, who is pregnant via immaculate conception by an angel, yes, Roman gets super jealous and goes on a drug bender that leaves him in a coma for two weeks where he undergoes a spiritual underworld journey to discover his inner self. Except it doesn't really work or go anywhere, and... He still doesn't know he's a vampire, though when he wakes up, at least he and Peter get to get back together and continue their quest to find the Vargulf. This is Letha. She's Roman's cousin, who he's creepily close to and overprotective of, but we find out later that she's actually his half-sister because her dad, the other Godfrey brother, is Roman's real dad, who's been having an affair with Roman's slutty vampire mom Olivia since before her husband died. And since both boys are in love with Letha, and each other, you can't convince me otherwise, their main motivation is stopping the killer before it targets Letha next. Which they do! She is saved! Only to then die horribly in childbirth. What does this show have against women? What, what does Brian McGreevy like to see girls do besides have teenage sex? Get brutally slaughtered, apparently. At the end of the show, we find out that it wasn't an angel who impregnated Letha, but actually Roman himself in a super incesty twist. He doesn't remember this because he was like under his mother's hypnosis or something because his mom was hoping to make another vampire baby. 
but it's unclear whether it works or not, because first they say the baby's died, and then may maybe Dr. Price brings it back, but anyway, it's here now, and then she tries to get Roman to kill the baby to embrace his vampire powers. But he brutally kills his mom instead, and now he's king of Vampire Town. Though it's pretty clear Vampire Mom will come back next season, because Dr. Price takes her body to his laboratory to do some weird science to it. But back to the serial killer plot. So, it turns out the Vargolf was this girl named Christina, who starts out as Peter's friend, but then completely randomly turns on him and tells everyone at school he's a werewolf. You see, she wants to be an author, so she tries to have as many horrible life experiences as she can for the sake of becoming worldly enough to be a good writer. As you do. Because art is suffering, don't you know? I want to felt life. Because I want to be an author. So, like, all the horrible things that happened to me, they're okay because they just bring me closer to enlightenment. Seriously, this entire story was written by that guy in your MFA. Christina turns herself into a werewolf by drinking out of Peter's paw print, but for some reason she goes crazy and becomes a Vargolf instead. And then we find out that the reason she was attacking all these high school girls was because she was a catty bitch all along who hated that the other girls were sluttier than her and they must be punished for their femininity. Even her two best friends who showed nothing but unconditional love and support for Christina throughout her entire descent into madness. Oh, but see, they were shallow, so they deserved to die. Look at these girls being girly and enjoying their girlishness. Surely they won't be punished for this completely harmless expression of identity. Oh, at the end, Christina just really wants to kill pregnant Letha for catty bitch reasons. So Peter fights her in wolf form, while Roman uses his super special vampire axe his mother gave him. And by uses, I mean, does absolutely nothing with it. It seems all hope is lost when Shelley appears out of nowhere and snaps the Vargolf's neck. The cops show up just in time to get the wrong idea and shoot Shelley. She runs off into the wilderness, never to be seen again. Until next season, probably. After Letha dies in childbirth, Peter and his mom quit town to take their nomadic lives elsewhere, never to be seen again. Until next season, probably. But Roman is so heartbroken that Peter abandoned him, he embraces his vampire nature, lonely and all the more bitter now, and life in the Pennsylvania Gothic town of Hemlock Grove goes on as usual with a new vampire in charge. Ouroboros. Just because you put ham-fisted symbolism on it doesn't mean the fact that your story has no great impact on its world and everything repeats itself is engaging. <sighs> okay. This is a vampire review, so let's talk about the vampires. The show never actually uses the word vampire, instead calling Olivia and Roman upyr. Upyr are an actual vampiric creature from Ukrainian folklore, and the main thing that sets them apart here from other vampires you know is that they don't make more of their kind by biting humans and transforming them. Olivia and Roman were born vampires. Olivia was born in Eastern Europe in like the 1800s or something, so she's a lot older than she looks. The way vampire children come into their power is by taking their own life, which is playing on another vampire myth where vampires come from those who commit suicide. She has her vampire awakening after her slave boyfriend knocks her up and abandons her as a child, and in a fit of being a woman scorned, she cuts off the vestigial tail she was born with, which kills her somehow? And then her vampire father helps her rise again as a vampire. Roman slits his wrists when Olivia tries to get him to kill his own baby, and this suicide attempt is his final step into embracing his full vampiredom. Olivia's dead husband met her in the 90s in Europe and brought his hot, glamorous vampire trophy wife back to Hemlock Grove, Pennsylvania, where he was the most important man in town. However, she quickly got super, super bored. She proceeded to ruin his life and make him miserable and take over the town for herself until he died. It's implied he also killed himself because he couldn't stand what a horrible, manipulative monster his slutty wife was. Because the Godfreys are basically small-town royalty, we now have the vampires as a class metaphor. People often compare the old mill towns of the American steel industry in Pennsylvania and such to the feudal system of the medieval era. So the vampire is now representative of the feudal lord, aristocracy leeching off the lower classes. And since the only way to be a vampire here is to be born one, the metaphor extends to inherited power and wealth. 
Vampires don't bite humans to make others. No common man can become the ruling class. You must be born into privilege. And this vampire metaphor emphasizes how much of a myth class mobility is. Though the old steel mill, which the townspeople even call Castle Godfrey, is in ruins, they maintain their elite status with the replacement establishment, the super phallic white tower that funds the town's economy as the future of the same exact exploitative system, a feudal castle in its own right. As Mr. Godfrey says in the source material, the malleability of material properties, like steel, was what defined the crucial advancements of the 19th century. It is the malleability of life itself that will define the 21st. And that's what the Godfrey Institute now focuses on, manipulating life, literally playing God, completely unethically with zero consideration for the well-being of the lower classes. And now that Olivia and then Roman are in control, it will continue doing so all the more vampirically. And as the Ouroboros reminds us over and over and over and over again, this is a cycle of abusive class systems that will repeat forever. Look, no matter how unlikable and nihilistic a show is, we can find a social justice metaphor in any vampire. And this show is unlikable. God. I'm not going to say it's too gratuitously violent or too grotesquely perverse, because I know that that was the point of the show, and there's definitely an audience for that out there, but overall, the show's biggest crime is being kind of dull and pretentious. Pretentiously dull. Despite its many subplots, some of which never get resolved or explained, and vast cast of characters, some of which get completely forgotten as the series goes on, it is so overly drawn out that the pacing just plods along for the most part, and some of the uh, acting and line delivery is simply cringeworthy. Though the overly pretentious script, thinking it's oh so clever and deep, doesn't give the poor actors much to work with. And I'm, well, I'm not a fan. There were parts I liked here and there. The concept? It's a monster mash. It had a concept. And some of the characters' complexities, that they were such despicably awful people, yet still came off as sympathetic through their pathos and suffering. I do always love a good, complex, flawed character, and villains with feelings are always my jam. But, man, I I'm grasping at straws here. Will I watch the next two seasons? If you make me... I suppose this video was requested and sponsored by one of my Patreon patrons. Thank you. <laughs> I am the Maven of the Eventide, and I am, as always, at your vampire service. What's next? Let's go. <laughs>